there's a lot of material online about how to set up a sandbox campaign, but not much about what makes a good one. I've run a lot of campaigns over the last 15 years and I've had some success and some failure. Uh, the lessons I've learned from those sandbox campaigns uh, have helped me to sort of develop a plan or what I'm trying to, or just a, a concept of how I want my campaigns to go. So this is about what I want from my sandbox campaign. You probably have some different preferences. Maybe you'll find something in this video that will be useful to you when building and running your campaigns. This isn't me telling you how to do it. This is me telling you uh, what my favorite way is. Mostly I run and play classic fantasy adventure games like Swords and Wizardry. And this video will primarily apply to those. But if you happen to play uh, Pathfinder or, or something else and want to ru try running a sandbox campaign, this will probably, the basic concept will probably work for you too. My major goal in all of my adventure gaming is to create an experience that will be fun and build a bond of friendship among the players and sort of deepen that, that community or the spirit. I want my campaign to last at least a hundred sessions and support high level play. I want a variety of adventure types to keep the players interested and excited. And I want the campaign to feel like it's a real place that is coherent and has meaning to the players. When I'm building a sandbox campaign, I know where it starts, but I really don't know where it's going to end up. I can influence the direction it's going to go based because of the monsters or the NPCs or the, or the sort of the structure of the setting. But because I give players as much control over what they do and how they do it as I can, their choices and the rules and the dice will be the deciding factor. If they want to be heroes, they can be heroes. If they want to be villains, they can be villains. The setting and the rules and, and how all of that shakes out is really what determines where it goes. When I create a campaign setting, I only build the details about the, the area where we start. The, the part that contains the, the home base town or the city and I create three to five adventure locations like dungeons or ruins or a, 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 you know, a ruined temple or something like that. I create a collection of active factions, maybe two or three, and I create NPCs and some major monsters. I also have a, a sort of placeholder list of Factions, NPCs, monsters, gods, maybe events that create an outline of possible future events and possible future things that become part of the campaign. But those are just possibilities and they're not certain until I make a final decision as we go through the campaign. Most of the time, I only create as much of the campaign as I need for four or five sessions. And then in between sessions, I create new adventures or select purchased ones to add to the sandbox. I continue building throughout the campaign. I call the first phase the introductory phase. This phase sort of sets the baseline of the campaign and the players spend the first 10 to 20 sessions learning about the setting or the sandbox. And they mess around with the locations. They go to various adventure locations and uh, meet creatures and NPCs that live in the sandbox. And they develop an understanding of the themes, the tone, and the premise of the sandbox campaign. Most of the adventures in this phase involve exploration that are close to the starting town or safe haven where characters can quickly retreat if they get into trouble. Each character will pick up one or two minor magic items and they'll certainly upgrade to the best available non-magical weapons and armor and pr 
pick up a few spells. The majority of character deaths will happen in this phase. Low level characters are not very tough and dice have a bigger impact on them. Fortunately, players usually aren't that attached to characters at this point. Early in the campaign, I want players to become aware of the most powerful non-player characters, the factions and the monsters that exist in the setting, particularly in the starting area. So I drop information, gossip, rumors, they'll uh, find objects or clues or items that will introduce those, those creatures and NPCs to the players. This, I do this because it makes the third phase of the campaign a lot easier when I have high level characters and I'll explain that in a minute. The second phase is also when the engine of my sandbox campaign gets up to speed. This engine is player driven adventure objectives. The players are my creative collaborators. Players will ask me if there's a sage, a healer, a library, a market, maybe a city where they can gather information, find weird things that they want to buy, or maybe services like a spell. And I anticipate and I create as much of this as I can before the campaign starts, but sometimes players will surprise me. I get three things out of this. One, the players have provided me with an inspiration for future creations in the sandbox. Two, they've told me what their character wants to accomplish in the long term. And three, they've told me what is the most interesting thing to them, the players, about the campaign so far. If what they're asking me plausibly exists in the setting and I haven't already thought about it, then I say yes, but I create complications. You'll have to travel through a dangerous area. You'll have to slay the monster in this dungeon, or you'll have to do a favor for a faction in exchange for information would be some examples of that. When a player starts asking me, how can I get more spells? Where can I find better armor and a magic sword? They're providing me with an adventure objective. I just need to come up with obstacles and encounters that stand between the player character and what they want. This almost eliminates the common game master's problem for somebody running a sandbox of creating adventures that players ignore. Players will happily go through all the trouble that I can throw at them when it was their idea in the first place to go on that adventure. During this phase, players will have more interaction with factions, powerful NPCs, and sentient monsters because I use those things as obstacles to what the players want. The minions, the allies, and the activities of these non-player characters will create problems for the party and its goals. I really want to create problems for the players they cannot solve by simply killing something because those, those problems or the monsters or the adversaries are too powerful or too well connected. This will annoy my players. The intention is to get a player to say, you know, someday we're gonna have to kill that guy. This annoyance will be important later as player driven objectives for adventures in the third phase of the campaign. There will be fewer character deaths in the second phase because characters become more durable. They have more access to healing and protective magic. And if the setting has a raised dead spell, the player might opt to have their character brought back, even if it costs them a lot of money or they'll owe a favor to the temple uh, where they get the spell cast. Just as before, I continue to expand and deepen the sandbox between sessions. I build on those goals or objectives that the players have told me about and I bring in ideas that were those placeholder ideas that I wrote down during campaign creation but didn't do much with. At about ninth level we enter the third phase. It might take a hundred sessions or more to reach 
this point. I've run two campaigns that hit this kind of level of play, and they were really my most favorite and successful campaigns. Just to achieve ninth level, characters need to acquire a lot of treasure and overcome a lot of powerful monsters. By this time, each player character will have three or four or maybe more magic items each. The party might even have an artifact or some other major magic item. After a few years of constant play, the group of players are going to know how to work as a team. The party will become well known among all the most powerful factions and, and non-player characters in the setting because of their strength and their capability. Player-driven adventure objectives become very important to me in the third phase. Those annoying non-player characters, the sentient monsters and factions that were insurmountable when the player, when the parties were, were around fifth level will become targets for the party during the third phase. That's why I put these things into the setting from the start. That irritation that annoyance that the party has been feeling, the players have experienced, has been building up for maybe years, tens or dozens of, setting, of, of adventure sessions. And now it's payback time. I anticipate that players will be looking for ways to kill those NPCs. These uh, acts of revenge could become a focus of the campaign for a long time. Powerful wizards, emperors, monsters, they all have plenty of their own resources and their own personal power. So the party will have to do a lot of information gathering, planning. They might have to acquire a new magic item or maybe even create one just so they can get ready for a big showdown with their nemesis. Usually players will start asking about how they can take over kingdoms, build a wizard tower, or construct a massive temple to their god. Those are big time ambitions and the party's enemies will be looking for a way to mess with them. These could be campaigns all on their own, lasting dozens of sessions. The final optimal phase of a campaign is when players have done incredible things are now at a level of power where they're basically fantasy superheroes. There's almost nothing in the standard monster books that will uh, that they can't defeat. And this is when I would get into things like Elder Gods threatening the entire world, rifts in time and space, traveling through the planes of existence, alien invasions, whatever. Uh, very few campaigns ever get to that level, but it does happen. Well, there it is. When I'm building a sandbox campaign, that's what I'm hoping to accomplish. I never know where the campaign will end up or precisely the substance of the adventures in phases two and three until we get there. I create adventures as the campaign progresses based on what the players tell me they want through the actions of their characters. Understanding how a sandbox campaign progresses from a group of ragtag adventurers who can barely afford chain mail to mighty heroes who assault the deepest pits of hell has helped me to develop my own process for building campaigns with a solid foundation but flexible structure that can adapt to whatever surprises players throw at me.